Hi, I'm Lieutenant Manning of the Durham County Sheriff's Office Training and Recruitment Division, and welcome to Hazardous Materials 2020 in Service Training for Law Enforcement. The law enforcement profession demands officers to be knowledgeable and proficient in their duties, responsibilities, and assignments. Often we experience various situations requiring a timely decision that has an impact on all involved. Furthermore, officers must possess a strong sense of awareness to create a solution for the current problem. Hazardous materials pose not only a danger to our society, but the responding officers. Sadly, the seriousness of the topic is a cause of death on the Officer Down Memorial website page. Deaths from 9-11 related illnesses have reached 203 and will probably increase. And from 1907 until the present, we have lost 44 officers to exposures from toxins. Hazardous locations. In our daily duties, sometimes we are presented and exposed to potential situations that involve hazardous materials, such as if you're patrolling a, a rural area where there's farms that could be pesticides and chemicals, certainly in warehouse districts. We do have clandestine labs in Durham, and of course, over 90% of hazardous material spills occur on interstates. Training objectives. Hopefully by the end of this block of instruction, you'll be able to define hazardous materials and the risk associated with them during a hazardous materials incident. Describe the duties of an awareness level first responder at the scene of a hazardous material incident. List methods used to recognize the presence of a hazardous material to include the identification of the possible material or substance based on a readily available clues. Demonstrate the ability to use the DOT emergency response guidebook and identifying a hazardous material and appropriate first responder actions to include notifying additional resources. Recognize hazards when responding to a potential incident involving illicit drug laboratories and chemical suicides and how to implement an appropriate protective measures. We are sworn to protect and serve the public from various situations including hazardous materials incidents. As mentioned earlier, we often encounter environments where hazardous materials may be present. We must utilize a safe response and protocol when dealing with these dangerous materials and situations. You should be aware that various organizations have different definitions of hazardous materials. The following information in your lesson plan pertains to the definitions of hazardous materials defined by OSHA and the Department of Transportation. I won't bore you with those those long list of definitions here, but for practical purposes and training purposes, you need to know that a hazardous material is any substance or material that poses an unreasonable risk to health and safety of persons and or environment if it is not properly controlled during the handling, storage, manufacturing, processing, packaging, use, disposal, or transportation. DOT Hazard Classes. Currently, there are nine DOT Hazard Classes. The Hazard Class of Dangerous Goods is indicated either by its class or division number or name. Placards are utilized to identify the class or division of a material. The Hazard Class or division number must be displayed in the lower corner of a placard and is required for both primary and subsidiary hazard classes and divisions if applicable. For other than Class 7 placards, Text indicating the hazard, for example, corrosive, is not required. The text is shown only in the United States. The hazard class or division number and subsidiary hazard classes or division numbers placed in parentheses, when applicable, must appear in the shipping document and after each proper shipping name. Class 1 Explosives Explosives are divided up by divisions 1.1 to 1.6. 1 1.1 .1 is explosives which have a mass explosion hazard. 1.6 are extremely insensitive articles. Gases, class 2. There are division 2.1 for flammable gases, 2.2 for non-flammable, non-toxic gases, and division 2.3 toxic gases. Class 3 is flammable liquids and combustible liquids. Class 4 
flammable solids. Division 4.1 is flammable solids, self-reactive substances, and, and solidly sensitized explosives. 4.2, substances liable to spontaneous combustion. And Division 4.3 is substances which, in contact with water, emit flammable gases. Class 5 is oxidizing substances and organic peroxides. Division 5.1 is oxidizing substances. Division 2 is organic peroxides. Class 6 is your toxic substances and infectious substances. Division 6.1 is toxic. Division 6.2 is infectious. The words poison or poisonous are synonymous with the word toxic. Your class 7 is radioactive materials. They are broken down into three groups. Radioactive 1, radioactive 2, and then radioactive 3. Class 8 is corrosive substances. That causes the destruction of human skin and corrodes steel at a rate of 0.25 inches per year. Class 9, and yes, I would remember that there are nine DOT classifications, is miscellaneous goods. This is any material that presents a hazard during shipment but does not meet the definition of other, of other classes. Awareness level responsibilities. First responders, such as law enforcement officers, are classified as awareness level personnel responding to the OSHA hazardous waste operations and emergency response, commonly known as HAZWOPER. First responders of the awareness level are individuals who are likely to witness or discover a hazardous material substance release and who have been trained to initiate an emergency response by notifying the proper authorities of the release. The public experts that law enforcement officers recognize hazardous materials and activate the proper local emergency response plan. They would have no further action beyond notifying the authorities of the release. An incident problem solving model identified by the acronym DECIDE can assist the first responder by detect the presence of a hazardous material. Estimate likely harm without intervention. Choose response objectives. Identify action options. And do the best option. Finally, evaluate progress. Officers should be very familiar with the emergency response guidebook before an emergency occurs, particularly the initial tactics. Become familiar with your ERG book and know how to operate. You want to resist rushing in. You'll notice that on the inside cover of the ERG book as well. You always want to approach an incident from upwind or upstream. And you always want to stay clear of spills, vapors, fumes, smoke, or other suspicious sources. Let's talk about recognition tips, or I'll refer to them as clues. You should be aware of indicators from your senses, such as your hearing, your eyes, your nose, do you see odd smells? What color is the smoke? Is there a visible plume? Do you hear hissing noises like from a pressure leak? Do you see vapor clouds? What about an odd or unusual taste in your mouth? Do you feel burning or sensation on your skin? What about the surroundings? What kind of buildings are you around? Are you in a warehouse district? The container shapes and construction. Are you responding to an overturned tractor trailer? If possible, try to identify the placards. They would give you a great resource tool. And observe unlabeled containers with other indicators, such as persons exhibiting symptoms of exposure. Let's talk about identification now. Protection of life and safety of emergency personnel and general public is our first concern and always will be. Utilize visible information from packaging. Utilize visible information from placards shipping papers, material safety data sheets as well if it's a fixed facility. And look for, for people with physical symptoms experienced by the victims. And of course, use your ERG book. The ERG serves as a guide to assist emergency responders in quickly identifying the specific or generic hazards of a material involved in an emergency incident. It also provides information on protecting the responder and the public during the initial phase of the hazardous materials incident. 
the yellow pages. The yellow pages at the beginning of the ERG have numerically sequent listing of four digit hazard material identification numbers followed by a three digit emergency response guide number and the name of the material. The guide numbers refer to the orange bordered pages near the end of the book which spells out the hazard encountered in the event of a transportation related release and the immediate emergency response procedure. The blue border pages are similar to the yellow border pages and are alphabetically sequenced by the name of the hazardous material. The orange border pages are your emergency response guides, which include potential hazards to health, the risk of fire or explosion, and emergency response procedures. The green border pages are your isolation and evacuation tables. And the white pages are located at the beginning of the ERG and they provide instructions on how to use the book and where to call for emergency assistance and an overview of the hazard classification system and an explanation of placards and other warning systems. When you utilize your ERG book, it comes in three simple steps. Step one, you want to identify the material by locating one of the following, the four digit ID number on a placard, orange panel, or a shipping document. The name of the material on the shipping doc document, placket, or package. If an ID number or the name of the material is located, find the corresponding placard in front of the ERG and use the reference response guide number. If there is no identifying information and the material is believed to be hazardous, use ERG Guide 111. If an explosive is, sus is suspected, but no number or UN number is present, use ERG Guide 112. Step 2. Find the appropriate three-digit guide number in either the ID number index, your yellow border pages, or the name of material index, your blue border pages. Step three, locate the numbered ERG orange border pages and carefully read both pages. Illicit drug laboratories. Clandestine labs are often referred to as homegrown drug labs and they're becoming more prevalent in recent years. Some of these labs pertain specifically to methamphetamine. The process of making illegal drugs can be fairly simple and the material to do so is readily available. Unfortunately, it's the byproducts produced from these labs that can be extremely hazardous to health and safety of first responders. Let's talk about these signs of an illicit drug lab. Chemicals and products typically found in meth labs may include, but are not limited to, Red phosphorus, iodine crystals, sodium metal or lithium from batteries, pellets, wire solids, and hydrous ammonia, starting fluid, or Coleman fuel. Ether, ether, sulfuric acid from the drain opener, hydrochloric acid, so sodium hydroxide, salt, lighter fluid, ammonium nitrate, which can be taken from instant coal packs. Also equipment found in meth labs. First responders should be familiar with the types of equipment used in the process. Some of these items include, but are not limited to, condenser tubes. These are used to cool vapors produced during the cooking procedure. Filters, such as coffee and cloth material. Funnels and turkey basters. Gas containers, such as propane cylinders, fire extinguishers. Self-contained breathing apparatus tanks. Glass glassware, such as Pyrex, or Visions, and cookware brand, mason jars. Heat sources, including burners, hot plates, microwave ovens and camp stoves, grinders used to grind up epinephrine, PHP papers, and tubing such as plastic or rubber. Additional clues. Windows covered with plastic or tin foil. Knowledge of renters who pay their landlords with cash. Unusual security systems or devices. Increased activity, especially at night. Unusual structures. Discoloration of structures and pavement and soil. Strong odor of solvents, smell of ammonia, starting fluid, or ether. Iodine, a chemical stained bathroom or ki kitchen fixtures. And then again, also excessive trash. Let's talk about protective measures for first responders. PPE should always be utilized when entering or dealing with a potential drug lab. During illicit lab responses, the PPE selection is based upon an assessment of intelligence about laboratory operations, contents, outward warning signs, detection clues such as protective clothing used by the operator, activity or animals in the laboratory, and interviews with neighbors. 
law enforcement act activities may require PPE designed for tactical law enforcement operations. This PPE must be thoroughly evaluated to ensure the appropriateness of the anticipated hazards identified during the risk assessment process. It is imperative that the officer contact the SBI as soon as possible to inform them of the situation. Chemical suicides, and yes, the Durham community has had numerous cases involving chemical suicides and they are extremely hazardous to the first responder. Seven used chemicals and chemical suicide. Hydrogen sulfide, sodium cyanide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, sodium azide, helium and nitrogen, ammonium phosphide, Signs of potential chemical suicide. Signs placed, notes or biohazard symbols placed on windows or doors. Smell of rotten eggs, burnt almonds or sewer gas. Be aware that there may not be any detectable odor as well. Open pails, buckets or coolers. Chemical or cleaning detergent containers, vents, windows and doors that have been taped and sealed. Of course, an unresponsive subject and tarnished pennies. Protective measures for chemical suicides. Do not open doors. If you guys remember several years ago in Wake County, two Wake County deputies were severely injured when they suspected an individual was either sleeping or passed away in a locked car. They gained entry and breached the car door and were exposed to harmful vapors and both were hospitalized. Do not approach or breathe near the contaminated area. Keep everyone away from the area and stand upwind of the incident. Contact the fire department and emergency medical services for assistance. Air purifying respirators such as gas masks will not usually protect you from these type of gases and fumes. Please understand that not everyone in the agency is issued a gas mask and the gas masks that we are typically issued are for riot control agents, not chem and bioware. Keep ignition sources away from the area due to some of the byproducts possibly being flammable. It's also to be noted that chemical suicides are referred to as detergent suicides. Fentanyl. Over the last several years, communities across the U.S. have seen a huge increase in the use of opioids. Most are derivatives from the synthetic drug fentanyl. Desmethylfentanyl is 40 times more potent than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. Street names for fentanyl and fentanyl-based heroin include Apache, China Girl, China White, Dance Fever, Friend, Goodfella, Jackpot, Murder 8, TNT, and even Tango and Cash. Accidental exposure to first responders can pose a real and serious danger. General safety recommendations. If any substance encountered is believed to be fentanyl or fentanyl-related substances, the first responder should not attempt to secure samples or disturb any powdered substance without utilizing the proper personal protective equipment. If any fentanyl or synthetic opioid is suspected, the first responder should immediately contact the appropriate personnel in their agency. When encountering unknown powders, the first responder should always use PPE that include gloves, N95 mask, eye protection, disposable paper suit or paper overalls, and shoe covers. First responders should have the antidote available, commonly referred to as Narcan, if exposure occurs. Exposure risk and treatment. Fentanyl poses a serious threat to all first responders. Only two to three milligrams can induce respiratory depression, arrest, and possible death. Two to three milligrams of fentanyl are comparable in size to seven individual grains of table salt. Symptoms can occur within minutes and also include drowsiness, sedation, disorientation, skin rash, clammy skin, pinpoint pupils, and respiratory depression. Additional risk and treatment. If possible exposure occurs, immediately seek medical attention. Remove the victim from the area and administer the Narcan if needed. All people in the known contaminated area and exposed while not wearing a PPE should undress and shower as soon as possible. Grossly contaminated clothing should be bagged and destroyed as soon as possible. If the victim has ingested the substance through their mouth or eyes and is conscious, rinse the affected area with cool water. 
All skin contact should be washed immediately with soap and water. Do not use any form of hand sanitizer since most contain alcohol. This concludes the end of our block of instruction. Hopefully, you're able to define a hazardous material and the risk associated with them during a hazardous material incident. Describe the duties of an awareness level first responder at the scene of a hazardous material incident. List the methods used to recognize the presence of a hazardous material to include the identification of the possible material or substance based on readily available clues. Demonstrate the ability to use the DOT emergency response guidebook in identifying a hazardous material and appropriate first responder actions to include notifying additional resources. Recognize hazards when responding to potential incidents involving illicit drug laboratories and chemical suicides and how to implement appropriate protective measures. If you find that after this block of instruction, you have questions concerning anything that you have viewed, please feel free to contact me either via cell phone, my office phone, which is 560-0931, or my email address. Thank you.